Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at uh, Open Source Days. Um, today, we're excited to share our experience of how we at Netflix and Animation Studios moved from commercial RV to the open source version of RV. Um, today, we'll talk about the reasons why we made this change and some of the challenges we encountered along the way. Most of all, we would like to show how open source has created new possibilities for our team. Um, we hope our story gives you some useful insights, whether you're considering making a similar transition yourself or whether you're just interested in how open source is making a difference in production environments like ours. Um, my name is Mark Reed, and I work in the production technology group at Netflix Animation Studios. I'm a senior TD in the imaging department, and my main focus is an initiative we call Creative Review. Um, this initiative is all about making our review uh, workflows better. Uh, yeah, and my name is Manuel Macha. I'm the supervising TD for imaging here at Netflix Animation Studios. In our imaging department, uh, we are responsible for developing, supporting, and maintaining uh, our studio's review ecosystem. And as you will see, uh, a lot of that work revol revolves around RV. Uh, so just uh, for anyone in this audience who hasn't used it before, RV is a high-performance media playback and review tool and it is built for VFX and animation pipelines, where users need frame-accurate playback of large image sequences and color-accurate review capabilities. RV actually started out in 2005, so it's a quite an old program as a closed source tool from a, a company called Tweak Software. And in 2014, it was bought uh, by Autodesk, uh, which acquired both Tweak Software and also another company called Shotgun Software. And after that, Autodesk uh, started offering RV together with Shotgun, which later became Shotgrid, and uh, now it's called Flow Production Tracking. In 2021, Autodesk open-sourced RV and donated it to the Academy Software Foundation, where it became OpenRV. Uh, the commercial version of RV is still available today, bundled with Flow Production, production Tracking. And uh, at our studio, we've been uh, using the commercial version of RV for many years. But recently, we saw some strong advantages in moving to the open source version. So as I said, for many years, uh, RV has been really the central part of our review pipeline. The reason for that is, uh, a big reason for that is collaboration uh, with RV's Sync plugin and live service, we can run fully synchronized remote review sessions across all our studio sites. And our teams in Burbank, Vancouver, and Sydney, they can all join the same session. Everyone sees exactly the same frame at the same time, and that, re that really enables our cross-site reviews and makes them very seamless and interactive. Color accuracy is another very uh, important factor. So RV support for OCIO, another open source project, keeps our color management consistent across all our workflows. And that became especially important uh, recently as we have moved to what we call HDR-first workflows. And I'll uh, explain a little bit more on that in a bit. Um, furthermore, customization is also crucial for us. So with RV's Moo and Python APIs, we can deeply integrate it into our pipeline. And we have built many custom tools, views, and commands that fit our production's needs, and we have connected RV deeply into our asset management system and production tracking systems. And finally, uh, robust Linux support. So our pipeline runs mainly on Linux, so RV's reliability on this platform makes it an ideal fit for us. OK, and uh, this brings us to the main driver for our adoption of OpenRV. Uh, so as I mentioned on the previous slide, we started a studio-wide initiative known as HDR First Workflows. And that aims at uh, letting our artists work in HDR natively as much as possible. But as we increasingly worked and reviewed more and more HDR media, we ran into a couple of problems. Um, so our creatives regularly noticed artifacts like color banding when using a uh, uh, when reviewing HDR media using OCIO uh, version one in RV, making it very challenging to confidently approve work where color was critical. 
And uh, here's an example from our movie, The Magician's Elephant, um, which had a, um, a large number of um, shots containing uh, stylized skies. And if you make an animated movie, uh, it usually contains a large number of shots where you see the sky, and oftentimes they have uh, HDR characteristics. Uh, so you, I circled the sky there in, in the movie's poster, and then uh, I'm going to show the artifacts, and I hope it's, it's uh, possible to see that on the screen there. So with OCIO V1, uh, we would see this color bending, uh, in many of our shots, and that really interrupted the review workflow where creatives were asking themselves, are these artifacts actually uh, in the image or not? Um, when we tried uh, viewing the same media in OCIO V2, those artifacts disappeared, um, and that was due to its uh, advanced GPU processors. Um, the color fidelity and precision were exactly what our artists needed, to uh, reliably review the HDR work. And uh, yeah, there were some good news. OCIO v2 support was added in RV 2024, but the problem was that uh, RV 2024 also required Python 3.10. But uh, our pipeline at that time was still locked into the uh, calendar year 2022 VFX reference platform Hence, we were running Python 3.9. So this put us in a really tough spot. We urgently needed the benefits of OCIO v2, but we couldn't upgrade RV with disrupting the rest of our pipeline. So we needed a solution that let us move forward with HDR without breaking everything else. And it was really at this point that uh, we started looking seriously at uh, OpenRV as a potential solution. Uh, OpenRV already included support for OCIO v2, but like RV 2024, it was also set up to run on Python 3.10. And that could be in, uh, like another big roadblock for us, but now that we had full source code access, we saw an opportunity, and after some investigations, we actually concluded that we could backport OpenRV to Python 3.9 ourselves, which would then let us uh, fit OpenRV right into our existing pipeline. And uh, when I'm saying we, um, I'm really referring to my co-presenter, Mark, here, who's been doing uh, a lot of the heavy lifting, and he'll be sharing uh, some of his main take takeaways. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we decided to go forward with uh, OpenRV. Um, the biggest advantage to moving to OpenRV is um, having access to the source code. Um, well, this gave us the ability to continue supporting Python 3.9 according to our needs. Um, it also opened up a lot more possibilities. Open source uh, gives us the flexibility to solve pr more problems ourselves. If we have an issue, we have more power to fix it. Being able to read through all the code gives us a much deeper understanding of how everything works, allowing us to better support our artists, artists and make smarter decisions. OpenRV also opened up the art opportunity to add features at the C++ level. Um, we were no longer limited to just the Python and Moo APIs. And, um, and most of all, um, because OpenRV is open source, we're able to give back our improvements to the community, um, which can help everybody and not just our studio. Um, all these new possibilities were great, um, but switching from RV to OpenRV brought us some real challenges. Um, the first challenge was that the code base was very large. RV's been around for a long time and has grown many features over the years. It relies on many third-party dependencies, and all these need to be built from source too. Um, integrating all this into our uh, build system was a challenge. Um, we use Res, another open source project, um, part of the ASWF, um, for our package management system. And getting RV to work within our Res container environment took a, a lot of effort. Um, RV is not trivial to build. It can take over 30 minutes to build from scratch. Um, and this has really tested our patience um, sometimes. Um, 
Backporting to Python 3.9 was the next challenge, but this actually turned out to be easier than expected. Most of it was handled by adjusting a few uh, CMake files and um, fixing some issues with some of the plugins like the Open Timeline I.O. one. Um, we wanted to make sure we weren't losing any functionality by changing to OpenRV. Um, we rely heavily on Aja and Blackmagic cards for reviewing HDR content. Um, having support for these devices was critical. Um, the same goes for the flow production tracking plugins, a suite of tools available in commercial RV that many artists are familiar with. Um, when we began exploring OpenRV, none of these plugins were available, um, and this could have been a major uh, obstacle in our adoption. Um, fortunately, Autodesk released the plugins just in time before we started doing the migration, so a um, big thank you to Autodesk for um, releasing those. Um, maintaining our own internal changes was another hurdle we had to consider. Because we were planning on maintaining our own internal fork of our OpenRV, we tried to be very mindful of the changes we made. In general, we tried to avoid changes that we can't contribute back to the main project. Um, by sharing our improvements, we reduce the number of patches we need, need to maintain ourselves in the long run. Um, we also recommend uh, to um, frequent rebasing of your um, your own personal of your of your fork against the main project. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is yours. Okay. Um, yeah. So, how did these changes impact our users? Uh, uh, honestly, when um, uh, when we decided to make the switch, our main goal with, with this switch was very clear. Uh, first, we wanted to ensure absolute feature parity to the um, uh, commercial RV uh, ecosystem that uh, users were used to. And because our review tools are used by every department and by artists with all kinds of technical backgrounds, so it was really critical that the move to OpenRV didn't cause any disruptions or surprises, uh, especially since we had shows uh, in the studio that we didn't want to disrupt, disrupt. So before the switch, our team did a lot of internal testing and we checked every detail uh, to make sure nothing would break. And, but we also wanted to look for ways to give users some additional benefits. Uh, now that we had the full source code uh, access, and actually the rollout uh, from commercial RV to open RV happened at the same time as uh, we rolled out a big UI update uh, of all our uh, own internal views of the software. Uh, you can see that here in the screen uh, recording on the side. So in the middle, we have the RV viewport, but then all the views grouped around it are uh, our uh, own proprietary views, which provide artists with uh, additional production context. So when we changed our REST configs to use OpenRV, uh, most users actually didn't notice the switch. Uh, the new UI was much more obvious to them than the move from RV to OpenRV, uh, but that was exactly what we wanted, no disruptions to active shows. Uh, but what users did notice was a lot of improvements and new features. Um, most importantly, no more artifacts when reviewing HDR media, so that was uh, our a main motivation, as, as, as we said earlier. And we also fixed issues in the OCIO um, channels menu. We added support for dithering, for example, when it was enabled. And we re also released a brand new timeline, uh, timeline editor view, which you can see there at the bottom, uh, which lets users uh, see an NLE style timeline with uh, preview thumbnails all inside RV. And that wouldn't have been possible in the uh, closed source version of RV. Uh, so the bottom line was our users got a smoother HDR experience and we could uh, finally also deliver features and fixes that just weren't possible before. And uh, back to Mark. Yeah, yeah our, our team is committed to giving back to the open source community. Um, leading up to this event, we um, focused on contributing as many of the internal improvements we made um, back to the OpenRV project. Um, our fixes for the OCIO channel menus have already been merged, and so is that the dithering support we were talking about. Um, 
Also, as part of our HDR first initiative, we've contributed back various HDR transfer functions and some um, RGB to YUV conversions needed for REC 2020. Um, we also contribute the, our um, things for controlling presentation mode um, that make it easier to use. So. And we, we've got a lot more things we've been working on that we're hoping to contribute back to. Um, we've also like we developed two major plugins with open source in mind. One is the timeline editor um, that Manuel was talking about, and the second is a live streaming plugin. Um, it's a custom output plugin capable of streaming color accurate HDR video directly out of RV. Um, these plugins aren't open source just yet but we hope to be able to release them in the future. Um, if you want to learn more about these, I'll, I'll be sharing more about them in tomorrow's OpenRV's Birds of a Feather. OK, and um, yeah, lastly, uh, before we wrap it up, we just want to highlight a few things uh, you might find interesting. So first uh, of all, uh, we did mention these uh, HDR-first workflows, which have become very important for our studio. So if you want to find out more about those, uh, consider joining us for our talk, Blinded by the Light, a case study of HDR integration animation production. That's happening today at uh, 3.45 in the West Building. Uh, so it's a SIGGRAPH event. And uh, second, we're also excited uh, to announce that we have uh, contributed a new asset to the uh, ASWF's uh, uh, DPL library. So we have released uh, Soulmates, which is a set of heavy production scale EXR sequences uh, coming uh, with both HDR and SDR media. And that's perfect if you want to stress test media playback tools like OpenRV. It's a really good resource. And lastly, uh, we're hiring. So if you uh, find, found our presentation interesting and uh, could consider joining our team, just see us in the break. Um, and that's it. Thanks for joining us today, and we really appreciate your time and interest.